If I can ask everyone to take their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started again. Please take your seats and we'll get the second half started. All right, I'm going to dive right in. For those of you who haven't seen me yet before, I'm Tessa Pinkstaff and I am the Work With Purpose Initiative Manager. I'm very new in my role. Um, thanks, guys. I handle all of the logistics and programming for the Work With Purpose Initiative, so uh, part of my duties is this event, so thank you all for being here. And uh, before we bring Tom Nelson back up to the stage, I want to introduce one of our partners. Um, Makia Griffin is the Manager of Community Engagement for the Northeast Minnesota and Northwest Wisconsin region of Thrivent. And she is here because she has an exciting announcement for us. Thank you, Tessa. You know, Thrivent is so honored to come, along, to come alongside Bethel and work with Purpose Program. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, context of who Thrivent is, Thrivent is a membership-owned financial services company, and our mission really is to help uh, Christians be wise with money. You know, Thrivent believes that everything, everything we have is a, a gift from God, and we should be good stewards of it. So we really want to help people have a feeling of security in their, their finances so that we can actually unlock the generosities in their heart and that they can be a blessing to the communities uh, that they serve or the, and that they're a part of. In the back, you'll see a display. It's called, What is Your Enough? Um, today, we'd really love to offer you a free copy of Your New Money Mindset. It's a book that was written by Thrivent Financial CEO, Brad Hewitt. Um, every day, we're, we are bombarded with messages telling us we need more to be happy. But Thrivent wants to help Christian leaders start a new conversation. Instead of, how much do you want, we ask, what is your enough? What do you need to feel confident and content? And what encourages you to be in community? And what encourages, encourages you to live out your calling? Thrivent believes if Christians have a healthy relationship with money, Together, we can really change the world. As leaders, we challenge you to discover what, what is your enough. And then how can you help shape individuals' mindsets around their finances so that they can live out their calling and be a blessing to others? Uh, to help you with that, we are hosting a workshop. Uh, Thrivent has, along with the book, Your New Money Mindset, there's a, a, a four-week kind of study group. It can be a, a four-week small group study that you could offer, um, or it could actually be a, a maybe it's a four-week sermon. Uh, but we'd love to invite you to a workshop that can help take you through the book and um, its premise. And um, we would love, there's a sign-up sheet for the workshop that's going to be hosted here at Bethel on September 29th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. We'd love to have you uh, to be a part of that. But in the meantime, please feel free to pick up your copy of uh, Your New Money Mindset. Thank you so much. Thank you, Makia. Yes, definitely, everybody needs to get a copy of the book. It was wonderful that Thrivent was able to bring those for all of you. So uh, pick up your copy at the back of the room. And then I want to bring Tom Nelson back up to do the second portion of his presentation. He's going to be speaking on neighborly love. So I'm going to go get him. Thank you. Thank you again for your kind uh, interaction and a uh, lot of stimulating conversations. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I went high tech last session. I'm going low tech now, just so you know I can do both, OK? I uh, hope you'll appreciate a little low tech conversation. Um, let's, let's pray before I begin my comments. And thank you for your endurance and uh, listening. We'll have some uh, Q&A and interaction as well in a little bit, OK? So I know it's. Hard to stay focused. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Uh, we pray that the Spirit of God will guide this conversation, uh, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable, uh, Lord, in your sight, because you are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, on a, a plane trip from Portland, Oregon, to Kansas City not too long ago, uh, I sat by uh, two young men. 
Uh, when I'm in a plane, usually I don't want to talk to anyone. Uh, you know, I don't know if that fits your pastor thing, but it's like, I just love my little space. And whether it's reading or preparation or just vegging out, you know, some of you, you know, can relate to this. I'm an introvert to the core. Everybody read Susan Cain's brilliant book, Quiet? I mean, that's who I am. But for some reason, uh, I had a conversation with these two guys. I started a conversation with them, and they told me they were on their way from Portland to visit their father, who was refocusing. Uh, and uh, uh, I just struck up a conversation with them. And the younger uh, brother said he had just graduated from a college, a good college in the Northwest. And I asked him, how are things going? And he said, man, it's really hard out there. And he described you know, trying to make ends meet at Starbucks. And, but he hadn't been able to find that good job. And he had a ton of student debt. Um, and so I had this conversation with him. And I really didn't know what to say. But he was just lamenting the moment in which he lived and the difficulty of what it was like out there. I remember when I was a young boy, um, I would hear my older brother's loud uh, speakers, Jackie DeShannon's great song. It was the cry of a generation. You know it. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's just to the love. And while the world still needs love and lots of love, the cry of the generation I hear today is what the world needs now is job, sweet jobs. There's just too few of them. It's the only thing there's just too little of. Uh, this is common in our time. Uh, there is a cry across the globe. And it's interesting to me, if you'll ask me what, you know, as a pastor, and that's what I, that's my vocation, what kind of conversations do you have with people? You know, what's your crazy world like? And most people think that my conversations with people, whether it's in my church or, uh, or God's church or conversations I have with people as I go through life is about some deep existential thought or uh, a deep issue with their family or their health or a spiritual question, quote unquote. But I have to say in the last 10 years, eight years, maybe it's since 2008, I don't know. <laughs> but the most common questions I get are tied to economic ones. Uh, for example, the parents of a high school student, not uh, atypical, uh, their senior uh, is getting ready for college. And uh, if you're ever in that stage, maybe you're, maybe you're saving for college now. I don't know, maybe it's past you. But they came up to me after a message and uh, told me their daughter had uh, this opportunity to go to this good college, but there wasn't enough scholarships. And so they wanted the best for their daughter, as you can imagine but they didn't want her saddled with debt. So they asked me, Pastor, what do we do? Hmm. Uh, not long ago, I had a conversation uh, with a lady named Jane. She's one of the dearest people in our congregation. She's almost 90. She's the most vibrant person. And uh, she's the kind of person the pastor likes because she usually likes my messages. <laughs> and... Um, She's a real prayer warrior, and she's always asked me questions. And I said, Jane, how are you doing today? She said, oh, I'm OK. I mean, she's got her aches and pains. You imagine the age of her tent. And um, I thought she you know, would talk about what she wanted me to pray for in terms of her grandchild. I said, well, Jane, how can I pray for you? And we know each other pretty well, so it's not you know, just a perfunctory pastoral kind of moment. And she said to me, you know, Tom, and this is so classic, with historical interest rates, as low as they are, and even now, potentially, she shot negative interest rates. She says, I have very little return on my investment. And would you pray I don't outlive my resources and be a burden to my family? Wow. See, the everyday world we live in is an economic world, whether we admit it or not. And daily, we are confronted with global economic realities that impact our life. Um, the people around us, maybe we've experienced incredible global shifts in the economic world. Downsizing, we know about that. We may face unemployment, underemployment, our people may. The latest jobs reports, right? Housing starts, immediately impact the financial market. Let alone Janet Yellen when she twitches. The whole global world shudders. So the world we live in is vastly different. It's a rapid technological world. In an article in Atlantic Monthly, I thought this was fascinating. There are different theories about this, contrarian theories, but Derek Thompson writes a book 
uh, called A World Without Work. It describes the fast growth of robotics. Some of you might be involved with that. And he writes, the day in which we live exerts a slow but continual downward pressure on the value and availability of work. That is, on wages on the share of prime age workers with full-time jobs. So his scenario, and others have a different view, that work will evolve with all the technology and robotics and a new kind of work. His view is rather pessimistic about work itself. So people ask me, not only maybe 10 years ago, does my work matter? The question I hear a lot today, is there going to be work for me to do? And what will it look like? And will I be ready? Will I have enough money for college, for retirement years? Will I outlive my uh, financial means? The human need for security never, never ends. And I'm going to ask a question. As followers of Jesus, are we missing, missing something really important in our moment? Are we missing something really important in the sizable economic challenges of our day and the cry of a contemporary world that is saying what the world needs now is job sweet jobs. It's the economy, stupid, or it's the stupid economy. And I want to ask the question for you as thoughtful people, could the Sunday to Monday gap be much larger than we ever imagined? Have we focused primarily on individual work stewardship, as important as that is in our move? But have we ignored what our work means to others in an interconnected, flattened, global world? We say the gospel, all of us, I think, speaks into every nook and cranny of human existence, don't we? The Christian faith should inform our priorities, our prayers, our thinking. But what about when it comes to the global economy? And what does it mean for economic opportunity of others? And is it possible our lack of theological thought and engagement in the economic challenges of our world is partly due to a very impoverished understanding of Jesus' brilliant teaching on the Great Commandment. Could it be we are missing something really important that Jesus taught? See, Jesus taught that loving God and our neighbors is at the very heart of the Christian faith. It's a summary of the whole three sections of the Old Testament, the Torah, the Kataim, and the Navaim. It's the whole summary. It's the whole, whole enchilada. Right? The Law of the Prophets and the Writings, using English translation. And what is this all about? What does loving our neighbor, local and global, look like in daily life? What is Jesus saying? And what if neighborly love is more than just mowing our neighbor's lawn, as good as that is, or taking soup to someone sick, as good as that is? What if neighborly love speaks to the collaborative work we do every day? And what if neighborly love fuels the economic flourishing of our increasingly global, connected world? What if Jesus was a brilliant economist? When we look closer at the Gospels, we realize that Jesus talked a great deal about money, work, and economics, much more than we ever imagined. Most of his parables, Klaus Isler at Talbot Seminary, a New Testament scholar, has done this really well. He's a friend. He's looked at it carefully again. And with about four or five exceptions of all of Jesus' parables are deeply embedded in the marketplace and economic life. And this, of course, should make some sense because Jesus spent the majority of his time on planet Earth running a small business. And archaeology and Nazareth, Sephora is right north of there. So we have a pretty good sense that Jesus was involved in the construction of a lot of the Roman work at Sephora's. Jesus wasn't a backward bumpkin nobody. He understood much of this world, and it makes sense that he would understand our world. So what if Jesus, in his own way, points us back to that economics textbook in high school or college? What if the Bible has a great deal to say about economic flourishing? And what if neighborly love is much more important than we ever imagined in our world? So if you have any kind of electronic or paper Bible, I want us to examine a text. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Just to refresh us a little bit. Luke, in this text, in Luke chapter 10, lets us listen in on a remarkable conversation Jesus had with a lawyer. This is an Old Testament scholar of the Old Testament Torah. He was an expert on the Old Testament. And the expert asked Jesus how one inherits eternal life. That was a fundamental quest of Jewish life. The good life. We know that from the, trans, uh, uh, the great conversation, the good, the true, and the beautiful. This was a Jewish idea. What is the good life? Not only now and forever. The wise life, the hakma life. What does the Old Testament say about that? The expert asked. Right? 
And Jesus wants him to know that he puts him on guard, like, you tell me what the Old Testament says. And Jesus, again, responds with the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus affirms the lawyer's insight, right? The lawyer takes it from two texts in the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.18 and Deuteronomy 6.5. And Jesus tells him simply, now, go live it. Go live it. And you'd think that'd be the end of the conversation. That'd be the normal end of the story. Remember, Luke tips his hat and says, this guy is discrediting Jesus. He's trying to discredit Jesus, put him in a box. And Luke gives us, in verse 29, a glimpse of this guy's heart motivation. The heart of the problem is the problem of this guy's heart. It's a self-righteous heart. He's trying to seek acceptance before God and his own merit. And there's this massive gap before what he knows and how he lives. And I would suggest to you, this is my opinion, this is not direct linguistic exegesis, but the guy seems pridefully perturbed. That's how I would describe it. And he says to Jesus, and here's the text, who is my neighbor? Now, how we nuance that is contextual. Who is my neighbor? Or who is my neighbor? And rather than giving him a pat answer, don't you love how Jesus teaches? Jesus tells him a powerful story. A story that not only answers the question, who is my neighbor, but also brings needed insight into the question, how do I love my neighbor? This famous story addresses this fundamental question, not only who, but how. We know the story, don't we? Or do we? So beginning in verse 30, Jesus tells us a story, you know the story, right, of a man who is certainly Jewish, making his 17-mile uh, trek down the Wadi Kilt. Old ancient road, I've been there. Um, it's a common old road that connected Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho was a major center in the ancient Middle East. We have uh, Neolithic evidence, 8,000 BC, Madam Kenyon. Uh, Jericho, that's why Rahab such a, had such a thriving business. I mean, Jericho was a very dynamic economic enterprise connecting the spice route in the back door of Israel. So this is a commerce context. Along the way, this guy encounters the brazen injustices of thugs who rob him, beat him, and leave him to die. There are sections of the Wadi Kilt, this, this old road, that are very uh, advantageous for robbers. So the story begins with injustice. Meanwhile, right, you know, a religious leader, a Jewish priest, comes walking by, sees this person left for dead by the road, and walks by. There's all kinds of Jewish reasons of purity and so forth. But the idea, Jesus is saying, he just walks by. Now another Jewish leader comes by from Jerusalem, a Levite. He just keeps walking by this guy who's been robbed, beaten, and left for dead. Now there's a Samaritan. And again, contextually, you know, the Samaritans were the bad guys, right? There's all kinds of prejudice and stuff going on here. Most of you know that. And most likely, because he's not identified as a Samaritan priest, this guy is most likely a guy. And he is clearly a business person making his way from the middle part of the country down to the hub of economic life in Jericho to do business. So what you have here is the Samaritan is both religiously and, and racially looked down by the Jews. But unlike the priest and Levite, the Samaritan businessman has compassion on this guy. The Samaritan crosses all lines of racial bigotry and religious prejudice. He offers us first aid. And not only that, he interrupts his entire business trip and takes this guy to an inn so he can recover. The surprising hero of the story, as you know, is a Samaritan businessman and not a Jewish religious leader. So we have our first riveting contrast in the story. Notice the contrast between religious bigotry and hypocrisy of the Levite and the priest is contrasted with the Christ-like compassion of the Samaritan businessman. The Levite priest and Samaritan all saw the man who had been robbed and beaten and left for dead by the road. There's no question about that. The text is clear on that. But only the Samaritan saw him through the eyes of God as a neighbor in need. So in telling the story, Jesus employs an important word. This, this word in verse 33 in English is described as compassion. It's a unique word. Luke uses it three times, all in an economic context. context. It has a visceral, like when you see something, like the death of a child or the abuse of a child or something so horrendous, you have a physiological response to injustice. It's not just cognitive. You are literally sick to your stomach. You ever had something like that? 
So this word is an unusual word. It's not the common word elios. It's, it's a, it's a uh, splagnathon. It's a, it's a very difficult word. And John will use it later for someone who has uh, someone in need, a brother in need, and they close their heart to them. So it's a really intense word, and this story pivots on this word. And Jesus says that when the father sees the prodigal son in Luke 15, there are three times it's used, this word, and the next time it's used in Luke 15, not Luke 10, same word. And it's the father seeing his prodigal son come home, who is financially bankrupt, morally bankrupt, he's at the end of his rope, and the father sees his son and has compassion, same word, as a Samaritan for the guy who's been beaten and left dead by, by the road. In other words, after going to a far country and squandering his inheritance and ending up economically destitute, the father sees his son and acts with empathy and generous love. So Luke strings this unusual word through these stories. And what Jesus is saying here in the parable of the loving Samaritan is that unlike the two religious leaders, the Samaritan businessmen saw the robbed man beaten and left for dead by the road, not as a Jew or a Samaritan, but as he would a needy son. So neighborly love, at its core, is familial love. Woven into this word of compassion is a familial love overflowing with empathy and action for a stranger that is treated as a member of the inner family that we love, the family of humanity. Now let's not miss that Jesus is very explicit, unusually so as a rabbinical teacher, that the Samaritan does even more than offer first aid, which the, first aid which the Torah required. This guy is going way overboard. Like the generous father in the parable of the prodigal who puts a ring on his son's finger and shoes on his feet and a robe and kills the fatted calf, that's the word that connects Luke 15 and Luke 10. The generous Samaritan pulls out his visa card, guarantees payment for whatever the robbed man needs, injured, and puts him up in a hotel. An inn. See, in Jesus' story, there is a riveting contrast between the callousness of the religious leaders and the compassion of the businessman. But that's the one contrast. Many of Jesus' parables have a double contrast, don't they? Think about the parable of the prodigal son is really the parable of the prodigal sons, is it not? Isn't it about not just the younger brother, but the older brother? There's a double contrast. Here there's one too we miss. The contrast in this parable is between the economic injustice of the robbers and the economic capacity and generosity of the Samaritan businessman. Embedded in Jesus' parable is this riveting contrast, think about this, between the economic injustice of the robbers who wrongfully take what is not theirs and the economic generosity of the Samaritan generously giving what is rightfully his. That is how it is framed. Now, we just lost one of the finest Middle Eastern scholars, Kenneth Bailey. And if you've not worked with Kenneth Bailey's culture exegesis, um, it is, I mean, he knows the Middle East well. And cultural exegesis is important for those of you who are into that particularly. But Kenneth Bailey captures this parable. He says, this parable is framed in an economic contrast. It is bookended around economic contrast. And he's right. He writes, in scene one, the robbers take all the man's possessions, and in scene seven, which is the last piece of this parable, this literary genre, the the Samaritan pays for the man out of his own resources because the man has nothing. So I want to suggest to you that I believe that Jesus is saying something very important in this story. Loving our neighbor in need, true neighborly love, great commandment love, involves both Christian capacity and Christian compassion. This text teaches that neighborly love demands both. It demands compassion and capacity. And many of us have only seen compassion. And there are a few things more frustrating and difficult when you have compassion without capacity. Or ruthlessly cold when you have capacity without compassion. Jesus goes out of his way in the story to describe not only the merciful compassion of the Samaritan, but also the economic generosity the Samaritan exhibited. Truth, grace, and mercy, friends, puts on economic hands and feet. 
How is the Samaritan able to care for his neighbor in the moment of crisis? How is he able to help his neighbor get back on his feet? He doesn't just say, go warm and be filled. James talks a lot about that, doesn't he? The Samaritan had heartfelt compassion. Yes, we've got to have that for all of humanity. He also had economic capacity. Where did the economic capacity come from? An economic capacity that came from diligent labor and wise financial stewardship within an economic system of adding value to others, whether that's the first century or the 21st century. See, the gospel compels us to empowers us to love our neighbors in such a way that it involves both compassion and capacity. The gospel not only transforms our work, it transforms our economic life. You go, hmm, let's go to Rabbi Paul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he says to the church at Ephesus. We know, most of us who have a lot of Bible knowledge here, Ephesians 1 through 3 is all about the glory of the gospel, how it transforms us. The implications then and three on is it speaks into every nook and cranny of life. It changes everything. The gospel changes every nook and cranny of life, including our work in economics. Listen to what Rabbi Paul says. Does this sound like a midrash or a commentary on Jesus' teaching of this parable? In fact, there are many words that are parallel. Ephesians 4, 28. Let me read it for you. Let the thief, I'm going to read it slow, let the thief no longer steal. But rather let him labor. I want you to hear the words. The Greek words are really powerful of work. Let him labor, not only labor, doing what? Honest work with his own hands. First century agrarian world. Think of that. Let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Now here's the logical, it's called inferential conjunction. So that. Why? So that. He may have something to share with anyone in need. Let me read that again. Because what you have here is a rabbinical midrash on this parable. This is what Jesus teaches in a parable, and Paul is teaching in a propositional form. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So do we grasp what Paul is saying? Do we grasp it? The gospel not only addresses our greatest impoverishment, which is spiritual impoverishment, no doubt, but the gospel also presses into economic realities and economic impoverishment. It matters. The gospel compels us to live in such a God-honoring way that we do honest work, make an honest profit, cultivate economic capacity so that we can serve others with their economic needs in the world. Martin Luther, the great 16th century Protestant reformer, said, God does not need your good work, your neighbor does. What was he understanding? The primary way we love our neighbors, friends, is to do our work well. And from our work, we have the capacity to be generous to our neighbors in need. In other words, what Jesus is saying, the best workers make the best neighbors. Yet how can we be generous in caring for a neighbor if we have nothing to be generous with? Yes, there's generosity of love and prayer and time. Of course, those are all value resources. But the Great Commandment challenges us to better connect Sunday to Monday, not only by nourishing compassionate hearts, that has to be where it starts, but growing economic capacity in our world. Because true neighborly love calls for both compassion and capacity. So how do we connect Sunday to Monday? Not only between our faith and work, but between faith, work, and economic flourishing of our neighbors, neighbors, both local and global in our world. So let me just ask some questions. It's not accidental that we talk about fui. It's not just faith and work. It is, but it's also faith, work, and the economy. We don't work in isolation. We work in a collaborative. When Eve arrives on the scene, we have an economy. Right? My work does matter before God, individually. But I was, bless you, I was created in community. And the economy is adding value to others through our work. So some application reflections. We need to know our neighbors. Who are the neighbors in our life? Those you live by, those you don't. Who are those who in society you don't think are your neighbors? 
Proximity calls for responsibility, but in a globalized world, there's an ever-present danger of missing human proximity and the danger of insularity and isolation. Liz and I, my bride Liz and I, lived in Kansas City 28 years before we walked, not drive through, we walked through one of the most under-resourced areas of our city. And for some of us, maybe you're deeply invested in very under-resourced areas on the ground, but we took an hour walk, not drive, when we walked through in Kansas City, perhaps the most desperate neighborhoods, the smells, sights, sounds, and desperation and heartache reached us at a level we never imagined. And the question is, what does it mean for Tom and Liz, for Christ's community in our city? What does it mean to love our neighbor? And your best thinkers today, across all ethnic lines, said the greatest gift you can give in poverty alleviation is a job. Across the board of economic philosophies. And when you walk through a neighborhood, you see the integration disintegration of family life, of hope, of desperation, of training, of economic life. What does it mean, not just to have compassion, but what does it mean to have capacity? How do you help your neighbor? Think about how much good the Samaritan could have done if he hadn't worked hard on Monday. When you think about helping your neighbor, think first about your work and the value it creates for others. Perhaps the greatest act of neighborly love is for you to do good work in a global economy. Yes, take soup to your neighbor. Do all kinds of things like that. That matters, but your work matters to the global world. The Bible speaks a great deal about our responsibility to care for the poor and vulnerable. But how do we do that? Brian Fickert, who I think has written the best work, the best thinking of the Chalmers Center on poverty alleviation, which we should care deeply about, when Helping Hurts in his book, and he spoke at a conference not too long we had, he talks about the impoverishment of relationships and the complexity of human impoverishment, and that many efforts of philanthropy can actually hurt the poor instead of helping them. And he says, spending yourself often involves more than giving a handout to a poor person. A handout may very well do more harm than good. Both the generation of wealth and the stewardship of economic capacity through diligent work need biblical love and wisdom to guide it. You cannot help your neighbor well if you don't understand economics well. Because human flourishing and economic flourishing go hand in hand. So are we thinking about the importance of economic flourishing and how the gospel moves us that direction for our local and global neighbor? Do you do your work well? Right? Let's not miss in the story that the Samaritan incarnated neighborly love, but so did the innkeeper whose business provided a good service. That's an important part here. A big part of being an image bearer of God is to work and create value in serving others within an imperfect economic system. We're all a part of an imperfect economic system, no matter what the system is. And Dorothy Sayers said it well, Christian work is only good work well done. That's it. Christian work is good work well done. Unlike the thugs of economic injustice that robbed the Jewish man, think of the contrast of the innkeeper. Day in, day out. Who worked hard, maintained a helpful business to serve others' needs. See, neighborly love is more about how you and I work than where we live. Because the best neighbors are the best workers. I was reminded of this of an email from a member of our congregation who does a lot of international business. His name is Tim. And he sent me an email. I want to share it a little bit uh, with you. He leads a very talented workforce in India. He says, what I've come to realize that is my position of influence puts me in a unique position as a Christian. My workers in India are great, hardworking, college educated, have a desire to live a good life. They're fantastic. I pay, I pay a good wage help them with a path to economic freedom. And many on the team are first-generation graduates from college. They're mostly Hindu and Muslim. During my visits to India, they tell me many times my values seem a bit different than them. <laughs> and much different than many Americans they've met. Which is interesting. He says, I've been able to share my faith with them 
and my values, and they all are so willing to listen to me. He says, my neighbors in India now have a larger stake in a stable world and their families since they are connected to the world economy. You know, there's all kinds of problems. We, we were writing a book on this. Challenges with the economy and economics and disparities, no question. The free market-oriented economy is the best, worst system we've ever developed. There's nothing like it. A billion some people in the last 10 to 15 years have come out of abject poverty through markets, through work, through getting a stake in value, add, adding. And he says, and hopefully they see a little love of Jesus through me and my words. This is the global world we live in. He lives in Kansas City and leads a team in India. This is the wonderful world we live in. It's filled with possibilities, brimming with possibilities for the gospel. Yes, the best neighbors are the best workers. One of the things we must not miss in this story, too, is the Samaritan not only loved his neighbor with generosity, he risked his life for his neighbor. Do you realize that? Because of the context of the history and culture, the hatred and bigotry and prejudice the Jews had towards Samaritans at the time, when he took this guy to an inn, the Samaritan would have faced the very real possibility of a very hostile reception. Kenneth Bailey puts it in American context. Brilliantly. He says, imagine 1850. Suppose a Native American found a cowboy with two arrows in his back, placed the cowboy on his horse, and rode into Dodge City. What kind of reception do you think he would receive? That's exactly it in this cultural context. The risky compassion and generous capacity of the Samaritan is stunning. But we must not miss that telling the story, Jesus is ultimately pointing to himself, isn't he not? That Jesus is ultimately the loving Samaritan who would not only risk his life, but lay it down on the cross for you and me. We are that person, you and me, beaten and left for dead by the road. And we need the compassion and sacrifice as we are helpless and utterly without hope without Jesus. Jesus had both, both, compassion and capacity to rescue us. Jesus is the one true good neighbor. He is. Who demonstrated to us his faithful work, both in a carpentry shop and his sacrificial and atoning work on the cross. I want to just suggest the world still needs love. Lots of love, sweet love. But I have a hunch right now, the greatest gospel opportunity, one of the greatest opportunities for the church, globally and locally, is the intersection of the hunger of the heart for jobs, sweet jobs. It's what the world is crying out for now. And the gospel speaks into that. The church ought to speak into that. It's all about the great commandment of loving our neighbor. Okay? So let's open it up. I think we have time in your tables, and we're going to have a little bit of discussion time together. So I'd like you to interact with at least some of the thoughts I've given you on the parable and the implications of how faith and work should speak into economic flourishing in our time. So maybe there's a takeaway, maybe a pushback, maybe a question, and then we'll have some Q&A uh, after that, for like 10 minutes, right? We, are we on time? Okay. Thank you for listening, and have some good interaction around these ideas on your table.